Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever in the world you might be joining us from. Uh, my name is Elena Stavrovska. I'm currently working at the London School of Economics and Political Science. So I'm joining today from London and I will be the moderator of today, today's event. The event is titled, as you probably know, the impact of COVID-19 on women scientists in the Western Balkans. Um, what, you do, you, what you don't know is that this is just the first of a series of webinars organized by the British Council as part of their Women in Science Resilience Program. Um, so the COVID-19 pandemic and the consequent public health response of lockdowns and curfews has brought into sharp relief the constraints faced by women in academia across the board. Uh, what studies from around the world have shown is that women scientists are facing additional constraints as a result of COVID-19. So these range from the added burden and responsibilities of working from home through to the fact that fewer women scientists are being quoted as experts on COVID-19, all the way to far fewer women being part of the cohort producing new knowledge on the pandemic and fewer women publishing. These analysis across disciplines sh show that women's publishing rate has fallen relative to women's uh, to men's I mean, uh, amid the pandemic. So none of these constraints are really new. Uh, earlier research has confirmed that women uh, academics generally carry larger teaching burdens, um, have relatively little time for research and publication compared to their male colleagues, many of whom do not carry equivalent domestic responsibilities. That said, however, um, this seminar or this webinar starts with a curiosity about what the situation has been in the Western Balkans, especially because um, some would argue that historically the Western Balkans, most of the Western Balkans doesn't st start from the same um, from the same background uh, in terms of women in science uh, as some of the other countries where the research has been produced, the research I cited previously. So today I have the distinct honor of being joined by three speakers, women scientists in three different scientific fields, social scientists, uh, sciences, technical sciences and natural sciences working in three different countries in the region, namely Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Montenegro. First, we have Dr. Vjolca Krasnici, who is a sociologist and an associate professor at the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Pristina. Vjolca holds a PhD in social work from the University of Ljubljana, uh, a master in science in gender development and globalization from the London School of Economics and Political Science, as well as a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy and sociology from the University of Pristina. Her research interests focus on gender, nation building, human rights, post-war justice, and social policy. Welcome, Vyolta. Um, then we have Dr. Yasminka Hasic Telalovic, who is an associate professor at the Computer Science Faculty of the University Sarajevo School of Science and Technology uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. She holds um, a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics from the University of New Hampshire, um, a Master of Science in Computer Science from Brown University, and a PhD in engineering from Warwick University. Her research interests are in the field of artificial intelligence and data science, and she's especially interested in applications to medicine and uh, microbiome data in particular. And last but not least, we have Dr. Gordana Lashtovicka Medin, who is a physicist and a full professor at the Faculty of Science and Mathematics in Podgorica in Montenegro. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from the University of Podgorica, a Master of Science and a PhD degree in Physics from the University of Ljubljana. So Vjolta and Gordona have studied um, at the same university at some point. Um, she, uh, she completed her postdoctoral studies at um, Humboldt University in Berlin and Gordona's current re research interests are in high energy physics. She's also leading Montenegro's participation in scientific collaboration RD50 at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, also known as uh, CERN. Now, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping rules. Today, today's event is planned to last about 90 minutes, with the first 60 minutes or so dedicated to the speakers addressing the core questions around which the web webinar has been organized. And then we'll have 30 minutes um, or so for Q&A. The audience members will remain muted and without their camera turned on throughout the webinar, but you have a chance to ask questions and please do so in the Q&A box at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, you can do this while our speakers are talking or at the very end and I will convey your questions to the speakers. 
Um, I will also kindly ask the speakers to remain muted when they're not speaking. Um, and the final point is that today's webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available via um, the British Council channels in due course. Now, without further ado, let's get started. So the first question that I have for our speakers is, um, it's, it's more of a, um, um, an invitation to reflect on what challenges, if any, they have personally faced and professionally as women scientists in their respective countries as a result of the pandemic. Let's start with Vyolsa, then we'll go to Yasminka, um, and then we'll um, go to Gordana, and then we'll have another round of questions. So Vyolsa, the, the virtual floor is yours. Vyolsa? Vyolsa, could we maybe go to Yasminka and then we'll come back to you? Yes. yes. Yasminka, is that okay? Sure, of course. Okay. Yes, I can try. If my connection is going to withheld. Yes, so uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation uh, to, to be a person to, to speak at this uh, wonderful forum. Uh, um, first of all, I'm so happy to meet uh, all these uh, wonderful ladies from the region who, who have this interest to support uh, women in science. And I'm always also happy to talk about uh, science and I'm always also happy to talk about what we can do to empower more women to uh, to make greater scientific contribution and get recognized for their scientific contributions. Uh, can you hear me fine? Is my connection withholding? Yes? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, the, to start off, uh, the, uh, the question is how has this um, challenge that we are all uh, going through uh, influenced me personally? Uh, so, in terms of uh, what's happening, you know, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, well, the thing is, it's it's hard to talk about how how uh, the situation has influenced the women scientists before we talk about first how it has influenced scientists in general. You know. uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, uh, everything is pretty much the same. You know, in terms of uh, not being able to travel around, so we cannot network, we cannot go to uh, conferences, uh, and so forth. Uh, the additional uh, challenge that has been posed to us is that uh, it, we have this local funding that's available for research and unfortunately due to the uh, uh, situation the funding has been greatly reduced and most of it has been given for to cover the costs of uh, having a lockdown and you know uh, having the cover the salaries of people and uh, who haven't been able to to make anything uh, during this pandemic. So uh, it's really harder to find uh, the funding. And of course, uh, I can tell you uh, in the previous year when we did have the full funding, uh, uh, we don't have uh, gendered analysis of the data uh, when, when the fund funding is give it, given out. But I took the data myself and I performed the gender analysis. So there was a, there was a group of projects that had been awarded the funding. Um, then there was a group of projects who uh, passed the threshold but were not awarded the funding. And then there were groups of projects that uh, did not you know, even meet the threshold. So then when you look at the projects that did receive the funding, the majority are male, while the projects that did pass the threshold, they did have all the components that, that were needed, but uh, lack some subjective ev evaluation that was never explained anywhere. Majority of those were female projects, you know. So I was hoping, you know, uh, that uh, in this new uh, funding, we would we would be able to go more with uh, uh, this gender mainstreaming and uh, these kinds of uh, statistics where we would be able to uncover uh, these possible biases. But uh, uh, this, you know, is of course not, not on, on the agenda. There is like far, far uh, more important problems at this point. And then maybe uh, personally, uh, how uh, this pandemic has uh, influenced my research work. 
So uh, on March 10th, which was the last possible day it was legal, I managed to organize the uh, Women in Data Science Conference in Sarajevo. So it, uh, the Women in Data Science is this uh, association uh, from uh, Stanford University where they try to, uh, to network and uh, bring uh, awareness to uh, opportunities to, to women in data science. So uh, we managed to organize this great event where we created a good uh, base for uh, discussion of, of on data science, but also give uh, visibility to wonderful women who are performing great work in, uh, in industry, in academia, but also in our governmental organizations applying data science to uh, create uh, great solutions for us. Uh, but then, you know, the pandemic has started. And uh, so what I personally managed to do is uh, organize the, the first uh, uh, general data science conference. Uh, it was organized within the Mediterranean Forum uh, just past October. Uh, and it was very successful. We had participants from all over the world. We literally, you know, started in the, and it was, this wasn't, uh, it was a mixed audience. I mean, it wasn't uh, just uh, uh, female scientists, but it just, did, it was, the team was data science. But I must tell you, having this uh, with experience at the beginning of the pandemic, that we had uh, better numbers of women participating in uh, in the program committee with the papers in the conference and uh, all the different kinds of bodies. But uh, the the conference was very successful. We managed to get a, a lot of people from Australia, US, all over Europe and so forth. And uh, I think the COVID kind of helped us, you know, because uh, with the technology and uh, uh, accessibility uh, that technology has given us and so forth and with this new normal of having virtual conferences we actually managed to collect uh, great scientific work uh, during this time. So uh, I think uh, to speak about my personal experience uh, it wouldn't be fair not to bring up that uh, I have three small children and uh, this has course in my, my uh, personal experience with this pandemic a lot. They all three of school age and with with this and I know a lot of uh, female scientists also have uh, children. Some will some have and then uh, a lot of the times the burden you know of uh, the school work and all on sorts of things is not quite well shared you know amongst the the female you know, the the wife and a husband or mom and a dad, whatever, two parents, whatever gender they might have been. So, uh, and the thing is with, with my three kids, it's, it's uh, even if we share it, you know, it's still, it's still a huge challenge. So um, online schooling has been really, really tough. You know, my, my youngest one was the first grader. So uh, with the online school, I basically had to be a first grade teacher in addition to, to everything else uh, I was doing or actually shared the, the first grade teacher role with my husband. So uh, that that has been uh, perhaps the greatest challenge and uh, but also it had its reward because uh, what I say, I never had been able to spend that much time with my kids. And I like to joke that this pandemic has uh, actually helped me get to know my kids, you know, because uh, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be able to to spend so much time and really share some of some of very, very precious moments that have happened. So uh, uh, I think that's enough for 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 sort of introduction for me and maybe we can hear more from from my colleagues and I'm really looking forward to hear about their experiences. Excellent. Thank you, Yasminka. And thank you for bringing in a bit of a, a positive um, aspect of it as well. Um, Vyolta, can we try now if, if the... Okay, uh, Gordana, um, let's go to you now if, uh, if that's okay, and then we'll come back um, to Vyolta in the end. Well, thank you to, for the invitation for, to join this wonderful panel. 
So th to answer this question, actually, I think the question can be answered from many perspectives and taking into account the future of the kind of the future of the science we do and also the type of the scientists we are, because uh, the, the way we deal with the problems also depends on our personality and also how we are organized and how big support we have also not only from our family, but also from the collaborators. So I think what is important is also uh, how actually we deal with restrictions and uh, combining this with the pile of the duties work and how we do actually uh, sorting problems globally and not only locally. And I, I think that all my life actually I'm asking how to fix problems partially because I'm coming from the Balkan. We had a lot of problems during the past and not to accept limits, moved boundaries and challenging uh, which actually our society is imposed uh, globally and also locally or because we belong to some national borders or because of our past. But also I think we also a little bit uh, struggling by rigidity of our countries and sometimes with uh, not really openness uh, or open minds of those who, are, who has power to decide. So I think uh, what is very important to have a growth mindset when we are dealing with the problems and also to accept that as a woman, we have to balance also to give priority sometimes to our children and that when we fail and we think that we fail actually it's not failure. It is just uh, another path we are uh, growing up with our children and with the circumstances. So I think whenever it is going and it's if it is not as we would like uh, in our scientific uh, projects or in science, I think we have just to take it as uh, another advantage or another opportunity to grow up and put uh, next time better things. So I, I think that uh, actually uh, when I talk about, I think uh, uh, I have uh, personally, I, I, I am lucky because first of all, when we talk about that, I think uh, there are differences. We have to think about also the age of the woman scientist when you talk about that, because I'm senior uh, scientist and I built my relation to my collaborator and also strong link, international link uh, last 30 years. So now actually I a lot rely to my friends and colleagues from Ljubljana and also in the meantime I build uh, strong relations to Italy, to Czech Republic and to others which actually helped me a lot uh, when I was working during the COVID. Some of the negative scientists uh, feel essentially stuck, unable to care uh, some experience because of the COVID and I think uh, what uh, uh, this can be really frightening feeling and mixed with frustrations and insecurity feeling especially for young uh, persons, young women who has actually to uh, take care about short term contracts and to have or how they will be promoted to the next university title, etc. So uh, my answer actually when I'm talking about that, I'm it's, it's really opinion. I mean, it's based on my uh, experiences because uh, it's based on my own experience and it might really uh, differs from others in my country. In particular because I'm working in the frontier science and uh, what I do, my research is uh, of importance and priorities, uh, which is in the line Europe Union strategy for uh, development and research detectors, which are important for CERN to, uh, in order to enable new discoveries. So uh, my work in some way is supported globally. So then you are less uh, vulnerable, uh, less fragile when, uh, when you start new research or you are a young researcher who has to take, I mean, to develop own path and to develop a network. So um, as I said, I'm senior scientist and have established a um, uh, long career. I mean, about like the uh, last 30 years actually I'm working in particle physics. Uh, recently I'm leading uh, uh, Montenegro in uh, actually for the first time uh, in history. Montenegro took part in developing detectors, which is actually a huge responsibility to me. And this also brings me, uh, I mean, uh, I have to be very productive actually to act and not allowed actually to be vulnerable and fragile uh, when some institutional or country lockdowns are there because I have to think about also that our national program is going further and also the uh, researchers who are part of the team that they take part. So where I think we um, so we, we have budgets. I mean, we have uh, we had money for the researcher to go abroad, but uh, because mobility uh, from June due to traveling ban, uh, our researchers couldn't go. So what I did actually, because uh, it was clear that we can't do a national level and national labs cannot be further development, I quickly established uh, a link to Czech Republic uh, to um, now really uh, world leading uh, Europe and European ELI uh, laser uh, facility. And actually they, they became my host. So I I, we, uh, I brought some idea and uh, we developed, we start to develop their completely new and novel and uh, it will be very unique. Uh, mm, apparatus, so so new technique 
so I partnered with uh, Joseph Stefan, I partnered with the uh, National Institute of uh, Italy uh, and uh, with Czech uh, Science, uh, Academy of Science. So, so we all in collaborating and uh, when our students are also in August, I apply for user, uh, so to, to use actually uh, to get open access to re research uh, infrastructure there, so I can uh, work there and use their facilities actually and to build because we are also financially start to struggle. And so we use their resources, uh, but they were so wonderful, really so, so supportive that also they bought a lot of things. They invested a lot of in these opportunities and last three days. We had uh, last week we had uh, RD50 workshop and uh, I was very happy really. It was very successful time, extraordinary. Because what was important that our one students, uh, he should go there, but he couldn't because of the traveling ban. So uh, even uh, Eli wanted to pay everything for him for travel. I mean, for traveling and also accommodation. We, we couldn't do that because it was traveling ban. Okay, for me it's a little bit different because I can also stay in UK so I can actually travel around, but our young researchers were really uh, a woman in particular, I mean, uh, they, they, they just, we, they were sucked. But uh, regarding the research, which also they collected data for us and for our research was that their commitment, I mean, the, the people from Eli, I mean, our colleagues, experts, they were so committed uh, to the work. They understood the situation. We, I coordinated all online using uh, this uh, technology. So it was a remotely coordinated project uh, and we are still developing uh, that. And this was uh, one thing which I think works very well, but just because of the strong support of the uh, international uh, uh, global, I mean, community and also people who knows how to be devoted to the work and to be committed and uh, to feel responsibility to finish things and also to share gifts because they really, I think their work was kind of gift to us because we couldn't be there, but then they, they took data and they did um, also some, some development in the, pro, uh, in the setup. The second thing actually which I found really uh, extraordinary was because I'm teaching also basic measurement in um, physics. I used the COVID to teach students actually how to use, uh, how to, to measure their outcomes, learning outcomes, uh, uh, placing projects in the context. So actually that uh, they know if their knowledge is applicable because sometimes you are, they are gaining knowledge but they do not apply it and it's not actually towards the societal, uh, to, to creating solutions for societal challenges. So last year, and I published also two, uh, two papers, which is based on my work with the students. So we did a lot of like uh, um, non-contact uh, dispensers so for disinfection or uh, we built some se um, sensor based on ultrasound, uh, one setup based on ultrasound, which measure and warn people not to touch their face so they would not be self uh, uh, contaminated uh, by COVID or we, uh, we did also some setups for deaf people so that um, because they cannot uh, hear, they can see on aperture some signs of warning if someone is coughing or sneezing. We also did some, some setup for blind people. So if they cannot uh, really measure, I see people around, but there are some setups you can measure if there are people around which has some temperature. So this was actually very uh, fruitful because uh, I think for the first time really students uh, saw how they can Actually, we had targets, I mean, uh, on the subjects, but uh, um, the targets are achieved through the applying, uh, actually, to putting everything in the context in the current situation. So okay. really, I, I think it depends how, how we deal with the, with the problems. Thank you very much, Gordana. Yes, this indeed provides us with a different perspective that um, the seniority in terms of um, where women scientists are in their career also has uh, a role to play in this intersection of, of, of career um, stage and um, the gendered um, environment that we all work in um, is something to be considered. Vyota, let's do a third luck here um, and see if we can um, we can figure this out and hear from you. Um, thank you, Elena. I hope now it, it works. Do you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. OK, so uh, I would uh, like to to start with. Um, um, with a small presentation, I think on this very person personal experience on how to um, look at COVID and the impact of COVID on uh, on uh, women scientists. 
Um, first, I would like to uh, to begin with saying that uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic has is a novel condition, a novel condition for uh, at the planetary level that induced a big uh, and also marks a big disruption uh, that the situation is uh, has become surreal, but also it has increased uh, uncertainty. Um, perhaps you, this, this, the personal experience uh, since um, March 2020 until today has been the, the one between balance and, uh, and adaptation. So how to find the balance between teaching and the research, a home life, and also from the new rules that are imposed by the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So this, the, the pandemic has uh, pushed us uh, to move, to, to transgress boundaries, to rethink our, our, our self professionally, but also in the everyday life exchanges about the uh, so sociality, but also family and uh, uh, family relations. So uh, the transformations that we have witnessed uh, since the beginning of the pandemic have also uh, pushed us to think, to transform approaches and practices of teaching and research. And uh, the big, bigger change, I think also as the previous speakers have pointed out, has been the, the shift from uh, teaching in person and class-based to remote web-based web uh, modes. Um, and there was a, a kind of a twilight zone until, uh, for example, my university, the University of Pristina, shifted uh, to online uh, online teaching uh, in the third week of March. And we, since then, we have conducted all our teaching through uh, web-based um, and uh, e web-based uh, platforms. So, second, I think uh, is that not only that you switch te technologically in the way how you conduct uh, your teaching and also research, but in terms of in the context of teaching, you have to readapt to redesign approaches and strategies for online uh, online uh, class classrooms. Because as it is, this has been a totally new novel condition and novel uh, that applied that we also have to reconsider and to adapt and redesign approaches and strategies to teaching. So to rethink approaches and strategies uh, to achieve learning outcomes and also to address the needs of students and their, their communities. Because uh, COVID-19 has shown us that uh, the university cannot live in its own bubble, but the university has to engage also uh, through different, uh, with, with publics uh, within the society and also to address the needs of students, but also of their, uh, their communities. So, uh, yes, that this shift from online teaching, from uh, physical uh, classroom-based teaching to online teaching, uh, is just one also uh, dimension of the disruptions. Also, for example, that lots of academic exchanges that and dialogues and also collaboration of different uh, different research projects has have been disrupted by uh, COVID nine uh, nineteen. And we all, as we all know, science is. Uh, vocation that is peer ba based on peer-based exchanges through conferences, symposiums and workshops. Uh, lockdown uh, and social distancing has uh, worked against, uh, against that. For me personally, uh, several events like conferences, uh, panels, symposiums were cancelled from March 2020 to, to date. I think a couple of them that um, were events to take place either in, in Europe or the United, uh, or the United States. So uh, this, I have never experienced this before. Uh, and also for, as the life of academic is also to be, uh, to engage in, in dialogue and discussions with your peers around the world on the issues and themes that we, uh, we deal with. So uh, the inability to, to participate to uh, annual uh, conferences or for, for, for work has been one of the biggest, uh, biggest uh, disruptions. Uh, so some of these conferences have been postponed 
to take place next year, some of them to an unspecified uh, date, but we don't know perhaps uh, how and when these conferences will take place. This will be contingent also on the responses and how the situation with the COVID-19 COVID continues at the global, uh, global level. Uh, another, another, I think, um, uh, way in how, from my personal experience, and I think this also uh, my, the previous speakers have pointed out, is also this blurring of the private and the public space so that the classroom uh, becomes the home and the home also an office. So, and practically today, for, for example, for this webinar, I'm in at my, uh, at my home. So this, my home has become a, a room for conferences, webinars, uh, classrooms and uh, many other uh, academic and uh, and professional professional activities. Yes, perhaps this is also a gender a gender issue uh, that uh, uh, impacts um, impacts the the life of the of the scientists and also on the on the daily basis on how we we also engage in academia, how we teach, but also how we con conduct uh, conduct research. So the uh, and especially this the blurring of the private and the and the and the public. But and here I would like also to point out that not all women are are um, uh, uh, the biggest challenges is also uh, to manage this uh, blurring uh, of the responsibilities between the private and the public. And I think this affects women in different uh, different ways. But overall, it has an imprint on gender and especially on the, how women uh, women engage in science and about their um, everyday uh, professional activity in academia and in uh, research and in uh, in pu publication. But the idea not to being able to to travel and also to attend uh, conferences, uh, uh, seminars and, and symposiums is something that perhaps I had never thought about that, that I would uh, experience in, uh, in my life. And yes, but in the meantime, also the challenges for um, 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 adopting new uh, digital, um, uh, digital platforms for co meeting and sharing experiences. Yes, that perhaps the COVID-19 has also opened up, an, uh, opened up a whole new way and a space for more exchanges that uh, take place uh, uh, online, but not in, uh, in person. And I would stop here because I would really like also to address the other two questions and to see perhaps that not, yes, that there are there are many challenges that uh, that COVID-19 has uh, posed and the impact it, especially women in science. But I think there are also some positive so blueprints and opportunities for to extend and also to enhance women's engagement within uh, within science. Thank you. Yes, again. thank you, Vilza. And I really appreciate how all three of you actually spoke not just of challenges but also opportunities. Um, and especially because all three of you also mentioned the restriction on travel and the impossibility of attending conferences in person so then kind of removing that um, whole aspect of networking but at the same time especially in terms of um, funding the restriction of funding i think uh, with the new the new normal whatever normal might mean in the in the circumstances um, um, opportunities yeah. um, and especially because all three of you also mentioned the restriction on travel um, we we now also have the opportunity to actually attend events that otherwise we would, might not be able to uh, attend. Um, so I appreciate how all three of you spoke about the opportunities that have been brought um, forth as well. Now, given I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I will actually combine the second and the third question, especially because in your first uh, in, in responding to the first question, all of you also um, touched on this um, of how how the the COVID-19 crisis or multiple crises, some would say, not just the public health, but also economic um, crisis have affected women scientists more broadly in your experience. So I'll combine that question with the with the third question of how has this affected previously existing practices and systems in the region's academia or the academia in the country where you work in the specific field in which um, you work. Um, Gordana, let's start with you um, and then we'll go to Vyolca and then Yasminka. Thank you. So I think when I, if I talk about that and I want to address this question, 
I think there are two things which actually uh, overlapping and it's it's not really you can't uh, put really boundaries between when, when you try to pick or look from different perspectives because uh, if you if you do some science which is more locally or uh, you are more stuck or limited locally, then perhaps uh, there are different rules and you will experience different uh, conditions and also this affect your future work. But uh, when you work more globally, as actually it's field where I work, it's Hanji Physics, which is centered at CERN and future colliders, which is uh, globally important, which is because all, all these I mean, results will enable new discoveries, which and then the wider community of scientists will share it, and furthermore, new technologies will be developed. Uh, then, then is uh, uh, in this case we are actually. Uh, I mean, my work or my research is extremely well um, internationally and globally connected and increasingly collaborative these days, in particular enhanced by digital technology. So actually, this enable us me. Uh, my stu female stu uh, students or female researcher to work remotely and coordinate even building new setups and uh, put uh, further actually new ideas which are uh, also very expensive but with help of others you can build it if you know how to mobilize resources. So I think what I learned from all this uh, if I if I may if I'm reflective on all this, I think what is important actually that uh, COVID uh, uh, give me uh, time actually to to be reflective to see actually how how to max uh, how to make actually very effective your time cost effective and uh, how to be efficient and uh, how quickly uh, to mobilize resources and uh, utilize all potential opportunities which you have if you want to reach somewhere. So I think what woman has to learn uh, females and I'm trying to, to also to show this example to my students that uh, what is important actually that we should not play on the fragility. I mean we have to actually to to act. So uh, when you can I think it, it's quite OK if we ask for help from other collaborators or from other research um, institutions. So what is important is just go further and uh, uh, not give up. So your situation, accept situation as it is, accept that we are also because we have children, we are fragile when their needs has to be met, but it is also fine to put away sometimes our job and then be more efficient in the next time. And uh, regarding uh, what also I, I think last period, last few months, uh, uh, months, uh, helped me a lot, but I don't also I think change institutionally because what we need actually that uh, I think after COVID uh, things will be different for sure. Some things uh, which works before will not work now or we will apply different things. And uh, uh, what, what is important is actually to make institutional change. And what I saw uh, that our students, female, which actually have uh, most female students in physics, interesting, uh, they became more entrepreneurial oriented. So when we start to do these projects which are actually showing some setup which can be used, uh, their self-esteem was increased and also they they now uh, they want really to to be patent oriented. They want to to make something to build something and uh, I think all these things how we now applying science and play with technology and uh, co-creating new knowledge. Uh, I think it's very important also for building the, uh, um, um, this new, new new way of the uh, leadership scientists, actually young female leaderships. So what I'm trying actually to do through all my work, I mean scientific through collaborations and what I'm now putting for the, the way I'm teaching them doing project, it's also to build new generation of the female uh, leaderships. Uh, they, they will uh, uh, be able after finishing university uh, to rely really on their knowledge to set up some their business and to make uh, their own connections and uh, work further. So I think we can learn a lot of from the situations uh, uh, that happen to us and uh, how we deal with that and uh, circumstances and uh, other things. So for sure, I think that uh, in future uh, a new approaches will be applied, but we need also institutional help because without uh, institutional change, and uh, I think uh, they are, will not be sustainable. I mean, all these solutions which are now put forward will not be sustainable if there is also no resources for the sustainability of these approaches. Great. Thank, Thank you, Gordana. Um, Vyota, let's go to you now. Um, 
Yes, I would I would like to say that um, about your second question, Elena, that um, how how COVID-19 crisis uh, affected women scientists work, uh, I would say uh, perhaps there are four um, that I could bring forward right now. Uh, one is related to, to research and also the, the mechanics and how, how to conduct research during, during COVID. I think, of course, as the speakers may, uh, may have um, uh, pointed out, there is a different disciplinary dis uh, the difference here in terms of uh, uh, the, the ways how, we, how women in science and depending on the, on the science that they are, uh, they are working from. Second is, uh, yes, because of the uh, overall there is, uh, in Kosovo, there is a um, uh, deficit of uh, grants and research, uh, research funding, and especially research funding that um, is oriented towards uh, women in, uh, women in, uh, in science. So institutionally looking, even before COVID-19, there were uh, opportunities for grants uh, were very, very limited. So with the, with the COVID-19 and the restructuring of the, of the, of the budgets, especially for, uh, for education and for, uh, for science, I think this would also, this impacts at, at large uh, all women in science, uh, regardless of uh, whether they are in the natural sciences or uh, humanities or social, social sciences. So one of the challenges and uh, the impacts also was in, in terms of um, you know conducting conducting research and also the ways of uh, data data collection. For example, from the uh, perspective of um, disciplinary perspectives of the let's say uh, qualitative methodologies in the in, in social sciences, I think this also the COVID-19 may have uh, had uh, an impact on women uh, within social sciences who who work within that research within that research paradigm. And secondly, if the if the research is delayed if there is no no funding this has also a direct impact on uh, on uh, publications and publications as we know impact also uh, promotion of women within uh, within uh, academia because it's uh, as um, uh, without uh, without publications, also without without research, without publication, also promotion in uh, in academia uh, gets uh, prolonged and also uh, hampers uh, women's uh, women in academia and women in uh, in science. So uh, because there is already a, a gender gap in uh, in academia and in uh, in uh, in society, and I think the gender gap uh, also is not it's not something that is. Um, it applies or is present only in the in in the Balkans, or uh, but also large, widely also in Europe and uh, and in many places around the uh, around the world. And that um, gender equality in in academia and gender equality also in in science is an issue um, that is being also addressed by many different institutions nationally, but also at the transnational and global global level. And when we're thinking about universities, uh, uni universities are no no exception. And I think uh, uh, women uh, in the universities and also in science face many different problems that are gender gender specific. Even because when we when we look at the formal rules and practices, uh, even in the situations before. I would say, if you can say that, before March 2020, before the COVID uh, COVID pan pandemics, also the formal rules uh, discriminated. Uh, even if they look natural, uh, neutral, gender neutral, they discriminate against uh, against women. And I think the uh, COVID-19 uh, may have uh, uh, magnified uh, sy systemic uh, gender gender equalities. Even though I'm, I'm very much aware of that, uh, uh, universities and um, uh, that have adopted, for example, uh, gender policy at some uh, at some level, but very often that only remains uh, in the realm of uh, the formal rules, but not is not being uh, uh, being implemented. So I think. You know this. Um, 
if um, until COVID-19, we were discussing about how to, to close the, the gap, the gender gap in science and gender gap in, uh, in, uh, in academia. Now, uh, since March 2020, now we have to reconsider also what this gender gap uh, meant and also in what way uh, COVID-19 may have uh, deepened or may have also shifted in some way the gender uh, gender gap. And I think here it's important to look at also uh, uh, the, the, the gender gap and also to, uh, to think not to look at women as, in science as one uh, one category where all women would fit into into that, but rather I, I, I would say like take gender as an analytical analytical tool and look at what are the what are the uh, what how do analysis of the gen of the system from the gender gender perspective and also see where different women are positioned in science and also in uh, in academia because the impact of covid-19 and the challenges for women in in science may be different di uh, may be uh, different diverse and this, I mentioned one, it could be because of the disciplinary from where they, uh, they work, uh, but also uh, it, it boils down to, to age. Uh, uh, for example, junior, junior women in academia and in, in, sci in science may, may ex experience different uh, challenges. Uh, as a result of uh, COVID-19 in, in compared, for example, to senior researchers or senior women in, in science and in, uh, in academia. And then also, for example, women with uh, small children or, uh, house, uh, or single mothers who, who are in, uh, in science, they also may have uh, additional burden and additional challenges just because of the, of the uh, position rank that they have within academia or in uh, at the uh, career, if they are in the early early career or if they are in a more serious uh, serious uh, position, and that would also impact the the uh, the challenges and uh, difficulties they may experience during COVID. But overall, I think we should take a close. We should never. Uh, somehow uh, take away our, our uh, um, analysis from the structures itself and also from the institutions and in, in what way science uh, institutions, research and academia and academic uh, uh, programs and also institutions um, address gender uh, gender issues address gender uh, equality and, and to what extent also awareness about gen different uh, gendered how, how the institutions are gendered and also in what way uh, COVID-19 may have deepened those gendered institutions that would favor, for example, uh, one specific uh, category of women within, uh, within academia, while it would have a totally different uh, effect and much graver on other, uh, on other women, especially uh, junior researchers and newcomers in the, in the science and uh, in, uh, in uh, academia. So for this, I think, um, um, Yes, it's important to uh, to go deeper into into an analysis and to to exclude this category of women, not to to group all women into one category, but to see what wh wh whose women, wh which women, uh, at what uh, career level, and also from which disciplines. Uh, how they are affected, in what way, and also what are the challenges uh, that lie ahead uh, for for them? As we are thinking about how not only to close the gap that uh, before the uh, COVID-19, but also to to think at closing the gap and also to remedy uh, the deepening of that gap as a, a consequence of COVID uh, COVID-19. Wonderful. Thank you for the elaboration, Vilza. Um, so, uh, Yasminka, uh, the same question to you before we go to the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can address whichever aspect of the of the two questions um, combined. Mm -hmm. um, okay. let's, uh, yes. let's hear your okay. perspective. So, yeah, wonderful to hear from my colleagues for, and, and their different perspectives. They're raising all, all sorts of issues uh -huh. uh, in my head as well. But uh, um, what I was thinking, you know, it uh, uh, I think it's 
it's too early. Uh, we don't have analyzed evidence to speak about how um, this pandemic has really influenced the, the female scientists. We we have previous experiences, we have previous studies, and we have sort of a, a hypothesis where we where we think you know uh, what could have influenced in a positive and negative way. Uh, but uh, for example, um, in, in computer science, you know, Vyelta uh, uh, talked about uh, Balkans perhaps not being the worst of, of, the, of the of the you know world, and we have quite a few actually young females that are entering. And actually in Bosnia, this number we have almost parity in terms of students at the undergraduate level, uh, and we have this wonderful educated computer scientists. But the and they very up at this uh, uh, higher positions in either academia or in in, in industry. They, we somehow you know educate them. They get they, they have the, these great skills, but but we lose them, right? But uh, now the question is, how has this new normal influenced? You know what can we expect to happen? And uh, in in computer science, uh, well, I think. For gender in general, but you know, I always uh, kind of try to limit myself to my own experience. Uh, this unconscious bias is really what uh, makes a huge difference because uh, you will find it will be really hard to find in any of our universities any rules that you could pinpoint to be explicitly biased, you know, towards uh, any gender. But then when it comes to implementation uh, of, of the different policies, different activities, uh, and if you do any kind of gendered analysis, uh, uh, you see that uh, there's bias, you know. And uh, uh, the new normal, uh, we we use a lot of technology. We leave a lot of traces around of what, what's happening. So basically, even today's event, you know, we know how many people have been present, how many male, how many females. When we're teaching, you know, we know a lot more we can, you know, record a lot more about what has happened during our class rather than when we are uh, doing it in person. Also at the conferences. Uh, so what I'm what I'm aiming at that uh, we're leaving a lot of data, and I think this data is really invaluable for for us to analyze this current situation, analyze the current trends. And I think what is important is that we always put in any sort of analysis always this gender component to not just uh, see, you know, uh, how this conference has functioned, but then how is it has it functioned from a female and male perspective, and whether the the females have uh, equal contribution uh, way to participate and and all of these things. So, um, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm for, well, fortunately, unfortunately for me, depends on what the situation, but I'm always an optimist, you know, and, I, and in every crisis I see an opportunity. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, now that the data that we gather about how we have behaved in these times have, can actually help us to uh, discover the, the patterns that would help uh, this great female talent that we don't utilize in our communities and, and most of the time uh, goes to waste and not to 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 better all our lives. Um, so they will come up with with the new ways to uh, to utilize it and make 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 a world a better place. So that's that's all I wanted to say actually. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, I really appreciate how um, you all highlight different aspects from your respective fields. Um, so indeed, actually, but now we not only have more data, but, but we have data that can much more easily be disaggregated. Um, thank you for, for pointing that out, Yasminka, and, and the importance of a gender analysis, um, as we also were saying, um, of, 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 of this data as well. Um, right, um, so now we, I, I will move on to the Q&A. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, I will start with a question from Nina, uh, who asks, how can this experience be used to uh, push forward digitalization and greater accessibility of scientific resources and education? Um, I will ask each of you to maybe like reflect on it for about five minutes. Um, I'll start with Violza first, um, and then Gordana and then Yasminka, if that's okay. That's fine. Yes. And then Gordana and then Yasminka, if that's okay. 
Okay, thank you, uh, thank you. Um, I think COVID-19 has brought into into uh, into our minds and our um, conversations at the, at the universities on how to um, digitalize um, and also the but this brings also the the issue yeah, around uh, access to resources okay, thank uh, you. Uh, thank you. and especially uh, I access to has brought into, into an uh, education into our minds and our so um, the discussion about uh, the, uh, online teaching about um, uh, academia moving into more uh, digitalized uh, institution i think has uh, both um, benefits but also there have been many reservations staged about the uh, full digitalization of the higher education education system. If I would say for myself that I am uh, in favor of uh, classroom based uh, teaching, that I see a value in, uh, in education that is face to face and that happens in the real real time in the real work and also uh, in, 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 at the centers. Uh, physical uh, physical classrooms. So, but at the same time, also uh, I'm aware that um, the, um, the digital power is also um, directing the life of the universities and the science in it uh, in itself. And it definitely technology here and uh, digitalization has an important in important important role. So, but the question is about the access uh, to. Uh, to digital sources, uh, access to to online sources. I think this, while this the positive transformation, I think is that more and more students, universities, and also the society at large and stakeholders are relying on digital uh, digital sources. But still, we are very much uh, aware of that that um, access to many of those uh, sources is uh, is not free. So it's uh, and this then boils down to the question on how to uh, to make that as part of the education policy and science policy and part of the uh, larger uh, public policy to enable that that this is distributed uh, equally uh, for uh, all those who who are within the uh, uh, higher education sphere, but also in, uh, in in science. What we have seen in COVID, especially on uh, COVID related medical uh, medical research and publishing is really quite something is impressive because you see how much of uh, research experience, scientific knowledge, but also how universities and research centers around the world can come together, collaborate and, and uh, share the share uh, share research. But this has to be the issue is how to uh, to um, distribute that uh, equally so that also uh, countries that have less money for scientific research that they are be able to catch up and to through um, uh, digitalization and uh, ac accessibility of scientific resources and uh, and uh, education. Um, this is also a call for the, the governments uh, and for the uh, also European uh, institutions and at large and the publics at large to uh, bring education and science into one of the uh, key uh, priorities of the public uh, public policy. I mean, uh, science cannot live in itself isolated, but it's also part of the public policy and the states have, have, have the responsibility to make this happen and to uh, provide uh, better resources through digital digital platforms and and uh, more resources on uh, on uh, education as um, was a staple of um, human development and social development uh, also for the post uh, covid uh, recovery um, response great thank you very much vilza um Gordana, um, so the question is how can this experience be used to push forward digitalization and greater accessibility of scientific resources and education? Um, let's hear your take on it. I think there is a lot of uh, actual opportunities and a lot of idea actually uh, we develop 
some of them already now. I think what is what I'm going to do and I plan to initiate and I hopefully our university will accept it and we will be supporting for that is actually to, uh, for uh, co-creation of some uh, knowledge based platform for students actually, which will be shared platforms where they are sharing resources, digital, but also Internet of Things so that uh, uh, students are easily actually that somehow uh, uh, older students, our, our generation, they are sharing their knowledge and helping to others. So this would be one thing which actually works very well because when I teach online, it was very useful that they uh, function the way they help to each other and that they share knowledge. I think what is very important is uh, to get that uh, co-creation of the together knowledge and where students are also thinking about them as producer, not only someone who is actually we are putting into their head, but they also co-create together uh, inside the group, but also co-creating knowledge together with us teachers so that actually that uh, teaching and uh, teachers or students at university, but also in the secondary schools, or high school, that they see each other as partners where actually everyone can learn from another. So I think what is important in this actually where we are going, this economy for knowledge, share knowledge and uh, new economy uh, for the, the learning based on the learning and economy where actually an institution is actually a learning organization is how we learn from each other because now students are learning also from many sources resources and they can also share with us this is one thing second thing is actually that i think we have to develop and i i found actually that all this big huge i mean uh, rich uh, international research um, institutes and uh, infrastructures they are willing really to share their resources. I mean, we also thought about that to make a lot of video materials actually to share and to distribute to other universities. How, uh, for example, because while we, uh, we built the setup, we found a lot of, uh, I mean, things which we have to learn and many researchers which are working in the same field, they do not understand how to do that. But when you are doing a video and making this uh, I mean, presentation, uh, it is, is good things and uh, sharing these video materials can help also to other researchers, young females or, or young people when they are entering this field uh, to learn more about it because there's a lot of hidden knowledge which actually uh, they do not gain quickly or they cannot and they are, I mean, also because of the background, all universities do not offer the same knowledge to students once they are going abroad, so they, they sometimes they can be frustrated. So I think this is also one thing where digitalization and all these resources can be used really to, ma to, to, to make uh, society I think, where uh, based on the gift where you have experts uh, which are able uh, capable and willing actually to, to make as gift their resources and share with other communities. And I think uh, a, a lot of really, I talk about uh, with Eli uh, in uh, Czech, which are now uh, leading facility for, for laser, they are willing to do a lot of things in that way and to do a lot of for society because what is important really to make platform to use all this data, which we did now and we saw it, they work so well, uh, to uh, make platforms where it can be shared and uh, uh, really given as as a gift. So I think there is a lot of actually uh, there is also the data uh, by measuring of the data we make a lot of um, uh, repositories. I mean, uh, so this big data can be also shared and uh, uh, further developed platforms and the open access and uh, but we need also training for that because to use data from uh, all these research centers one has also to train the students and other researchers how to use it. It's not just to give data. We have also to provide uh, not only access but also the knowledge to use it. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, thank you Gordana. Indeed, uh, it's not just about accessibility of resources, but also additional training that might come with um, with that those possibilities. Um, Yasninka, how, what is your um, take on this? And I think, I mean, as someone working in computer science, you might have an even more particular take on, on, on the question. Yes. Uh, well, I think uh, I think Nina, this was a very good question because uh, perhaps the the greatest revolution that has been started with this COVID is this uh, online education, and if we if we know particularly in our region, you know how slowly any sort of uh, educational reform goes, to see that our schools have been able to switch to an online you know uh, mode of functioning within just a couple of weeks. It's just amazing, you know, as you know, especially I, I know like British Council is doing a lot of projects in education and and it takes so many projects, you know, and so, so much to produce any kind of a cultural change. And uh, this pandemic has made this uh, remote work and online learning uh, completely uh, 
completely uh, acceptable, you know. And for me, I'm very happy. You know, I function very well in this in this uh, online environment. And for the kind of courses that I teach, uh, uh, I really like the online environment. It, it enables me to combine different kinds of uh, media and to demonstrate uh, abstract, uh, you know, I teach, for example, algorithms or artificial intelligence, and there's lots of abstractions and, and things that, that you have to imagine, you know, in order to understand how to put all these pieces together. And with online teaching, I can actually use different kinds of media uh, and get somehow closer to the students rather than I just have when I have slides and a, and, a, and a whiteboard in front of me. So for me, I, I've been a better teacher, you know, since, this, uh, since I've been using uh, the online tools. Uh, but uh, also, I know my students have been using, uh, you know, different kinds of tutorials and tools to, to figure out uh, how to study even, even on their own. So this has been started uh, even before the pandemic. They, they go to YouTube videos or different kinds of uh, online learning platforms where, where they could uh, try to find uh, a different perspective on how to understand something. Uh, but then, you know, as far as my students go, uh, I, I periodically, you know, talk to them and ask them, you know, how how is this online uh, learning and so forth. And uh, uh, for the older students, it's uh, totally okay. You know, for the third, fourth year students, they already figure out, you know, uh, the undergraduate, what the university is all about, and uh, they already have the guidance, and now they are more about positioning themselves for the way out of the university, making connections with the industry, and they actually, a lot of them already have jobs. So in the third and fourth year, it's actually good for them to be able to manage their time better, to be able to, uh, to fit in in a busy schedule, both uh, uh, both their lectures and their uh, perhaps uh, work obligations. But then for the first and second year students, they just come to university with with lots of questions and where is my life leading, you know? And and for they're looking for any kind of direction, you know. So if you have such students just uh, just online. Uh, I think it's 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 hard for them. They really they, they yearn for this for this contact. They yearn for for uh, sort of more informal education rather than just just the formal education. So uh, I think you know while uh, there is a great value in uh, in the society accepting this remote work and accepting this uh, online learning as a valid valid uh, way that we can uh, use to, in some, circumstance, some circumstances, be even more efficient in teaching. Uh, the, this, uh, especially for the students who are just starting, you know, uh, a new cycle, new study cycle, I think it's, we cannot uh, go without this face-to-face uh, uh, -face lectures and, and more uh, hum human, human connection uh, subjects. So that, that's that's my experience with this. Yes, thank you. That's a very nice summary of the pros and cons of um, how fast we've learned to use Zoom and Teams and to make the what seemed impossible um, last year uh, possible within a few days. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more um, question um, and then we'll slowly wrap up. Um, so Amila writes to us, great to see the lineup of women scientists. Thank you for sharing. I wonder, she says, with the obstacles women face without a pandemic, do you see that this interruption caused by the pandemic may result in fewer women entering science in the next several years? This is a question for the region, obviously. Or would you expect quite the opposite? Looking at the ongoing experiences of your young graduates, possibly. Um, so now let's start maybe with um, Yasmin, if you don't mind, actually, I'll start with you, then go to Gordana, then um, Vyolza. OK, yes, that's fine. Uh, well, uh, uh, looking at, uh, you know, what what makes it harder for women to be in academia, you know, I already mentioned it's not something that is, uh, there are no explicit biases or if there are, we can easily solve those. those. But what, uh, what we have ahead of us is this uh, hidden enemy, this unconscious bias that unfortunately all of us have, including me, okay? So I took, I took a test 
And of course, I would never say that math and computer science are either for boys or for girls. But when I took this test, implicit bias test, I'm actually slightly biased. And I think that technical sciences are more for boys than, than for girls. And my conscious self would never, you know, would hear something like that. So the the culture around us, uh, the, the, the world that we, that we live in, is just bias and we must face that uh, when we see a woman that is in computer science she just needs to build that trust she just has to show so much more you know so if you see a guy and he says he's in computer science i'm just taking computer science. you assume he's competent you know and if if it goes otherwise you know that you might think he's incompetent for the women is the other way around you assume she's incompetent then she has to work very hard to get to the you know so uh so how how is the pandemic going to change this so uh what we have uh ahead of us is a big cultural change the same as this uh online learning is a big cultural change but i'm not sure that pandemic is going to to so easily fix this cultural change and uh, i unfortunately don't see an easy way out but uh, what I think is important that we talk about these things and this, this webinar that we have today is an example. So uh, we have to speak about uh, how is it to be a woman in science. We have to, uh, uh, I'm, I'm great that Gondana said she, she doesn't have a problem with uh, females in physics, which is somehow strange, but, but that's because they have a great role, role model in her, you know, so that's one of the most, most important things. So we just have to keep doing more of this and uh, uh, and actually question the unconscious bias that we all have and uh, do the you know data desegregation, do gender mainstreaming, do everything that we possibly can so we don't lose this female talent. So we have all these wonderful females that are coming and we just have to make sure there is room for them basically. Thank you, Yasminka. Um, Gordana? Yes, I, uh, I, it's really difficult to, to predict uh, what's going to be in the future, but I can say uh, something that actually I see regarding the change in the attitude which I see in the female students. And uh, I agree, I mean, if we want to produce female students who are more uh, competitive and more uh, self-contained, we, we need to give them competencies. I think what is important is you are, uh, we are all confident when we have competencies. And also when we achieve some results, it gives us strength to go further. So we, we need also to, I think, to give to students uh, a way that they build something, show something, apply what they know, and this really give boost. It gives them chance to go further. So actually what I saw, um, where I saw the change, uh, regard, and I think uh, what, what if I can predict and if I can trust my uh, feelings, is that we will have more female who will enter the science and even this uh, frontier science, which is uh, quite difficult because I mean for high energy physics, you need really to know the programming, uh, um, science, the engineering, it, it, it's becoming more interdisciplinary. Now a science, it's, uh, it's not really, it will be now in the folders place, but it's, uh, boundaries uh, are blurred so we are now entering entering the science which is uh, very uh, not only international but uh, international uh, oriented but also very interdisciplinary so what i uh, what i saw in the students or attitude students or what, what made COVID also partially is that our female students becomes actually more reflective and more productive and I think, which I haven't seen this before, but last year in particular, I saw it, but maybe because they were more productive uh, or using chances now, while uh, male students were less prone to do such things or to probe, I don't know, but uh, it could be also. Uh, so I saw them actually more a risk and action taker now, which is actually good. And also this will remove this cultural bias, I mean, uh, be between female and male and um, affect actually because now I saw when I'm speaking to them and when they are uh, actually applying for some projects or um, because I, I always uh, push them to, to apply or for some uh, 
projects here for students or competitions or etc. I saw actually that uh, they do not look really any excuse that they are uh, females or that they want any excuse because there is some possible uh, gender gap. So they want actually to do uh, and to, to get access and to be accepted on the merit base. So they are trying to avoid uh, any any uh, excuse or that because they are fragile or um, um, because of the gender issue or uh, that they are less capable because they are female. And this is good things because if they, they if we uh, raise or uh, cultivate new generation where actually maybe this gender gap or gender issue will not be emphasized uh, because when you emphasize something, you're also saying that something is wrong with that. So there are two, two I think, uh, points or two alternate um, perspective we can see how to fix it or how maybe by emphasizing we are all the time showing that something is wrong, that something is different. So I think we have actually new generation of the students, new generation of females, at least in Montenegro, uh, which uh, they want actually to be accepted based on the merit, based on their success and they work hard for that. So I, I hope and I believe and I will work towards that, that we will have more females because I think this uh, skills which they are getting uh, through these projects or to the, through this research or being on university, uh, it's also skill for the life. So being capable to um, uh, finish some project is also the way uh, you are getting skill in your life. How to how to deal with problems and actually not accept all the time limits, but to try to uh, um, blur them and to achieve more than actually some limits imposed on you. So I think there are many things uh, maybe we will see or um, uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Gordana. And now, uh, Vyolta. Um, yes, uh, I would. I would first would like to say that, uh, to my opinion, uh, COVID nineteen would um, stall the progress of women in uh, women in uh, science. But still, I uh, I say this because also, as I uh, report a couple of times today, uh, women in um, in the higher education and in science face already face a bumpy road in uh, and the hard hurdles that they they encounter are manifold. Uh, for example, they there are different exclusionary uh, practices uh, that discriminate against uh, against women and that they are found uh, and the, most of these are structural but also are at the symbolic levels for example the, the professions and uh, positions of women in academia still remains very much uh, uh, segregated even though in the recent years we have seen uh, uh, that women are entering also the fields uh, and sciences that were traditionally perceived as uh, male uh, male uh, sciences. But um, just a quick overview, for example, on our daily experiences also from the research that uh, have been has been conduct conducted so far. For example, we all witness bias in recruitment procedures, uh, that commit evaluation committees are mostly comprised by men, that there are no women, that um, the culture uh, is unfriendly, uh, institutional culture is unfriendly to, to women and also lack of access networks uh, and very important lack of women leaders, mentors and role uh, role models. And finally, also this um, uh, uh, finding the balance between the private life and uh, family responsibilities, especially for uh, for junior researchers, scientists, and uh, and um, early careers in uh, in academia. So. To me, all this uh, this structural uh, gender inequalities definitely should be also uh, looked at the, uh, from the structural point of point of, point of view, but also at the representational uh, representational level. And I think COVID nineteen may may have uh, may have may stall the progress of uh, gender equality and women's. Um, a progress in, uh, in in science, and for this, I think it's very important that uh, there are policies um, uh, within the, uh, the larger education policy and uh, policy on research that would uh, promote and also support women in uh, in science, because uh, we, there is no we cannot lose the momentum uh, uh, also. Uh, within the um, uh, these strategies for um, 
COVID-19 recovery to, to address also the issue of women in, uh, in science and gender equality in higher education and research, uh, research in institutions. But still, I would like to maintain a critical, critical hope that, and also to point to the relevance of, of leadership in, uh, in uh, research, in science, and also in higher education to bring gender also as, uh, uh, as a policy, uh, policy issue, as an, 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 uh, as an, uh, for gender, to do gender analysis, but also to make gender part of the, of the policy on the research and, uh, and development. So we sh there is no, we cannot uh, risk not to bring gender at the, at the center of the, of the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, research and development agenda at the national level, but also uh, international, international one. But definitely this will, will uh, have an impact and will stall the progress of women in, uh, in science. Thank you, Vyotza. Um I will ask actually one more question and then we'll wrap it up, uh, even though I'm mindful of time, but so we might go five minutes over the time. Um, at, um, Tena Prelets writes, it is so encouraging to hear the positive sides of the digital revolution brought upon us uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis, as well as the undeniable challenges. I was wondering if you could comment as scientists on the politicization of coronavirus task forces that has occurred in several countries of the Western Balkans. What kind of image of scientists do you think this promotes? And who is winning, science or conspiracy theories? Um, so quick responses, like a one minute response, um, if you will. Um, Gordon, I'm going to start with you this time, if that's OK. Yeah, I, I mean, from, from the point, I mean, COVID scientists, how actually science about COVID was applied and all these measures uh, imposed based on that, I, I I don't know, I think we need time actually to talk about that and to be distant from everything because I think often some measures were applied because I, I often do not know why, why, why there was some set uh, regarding some numbers and how some statistics was taken because also when you report some cases, we do not know what is underlining, why something happened, what uh, kind of the, the test was, not, not only test us, but uh, where it was applied. So I think regarding uh, that, how uh, COVID science, I mean, or, or about a science which is related to research on COVID directly, uh, we, I, I cannot really say much about that because we need evidences and we'd, uh, we need distance from that and to analyze. But which kind of the scientists or image of the scientists we are building, I hope that it will not be just based on the some statistics which is just based on the numbers, but we need really deeper thinking, uh, di more deeper uh, way of the thinking about that and the uh, reasons behind. And uh, I, I hope also that uh, uh, image of the new scientists or how to, how to say it will be really scientists who will have more wider knowledge and also who will be very critical how to apply their knowledge. Uh, and that uh, um, the, the array of the applying knowledge will be really based on the evidences because a lot of what is done now it's all about predictions and then going back and forward and changing and different countries uh, affected differently. So I, I hope that new a new image of the scientists will be uh, someone who will be uh, uh, who will have more inter, uh, interdisciplinary knowledge and also more uh, reflective and more critical and uh, willing to actually to apply to either community. And also I hope that we will have more uh, female young leadership uh, developed. Uh, Thank you. That, which I actually see. Yes, that's a very hopeful note. Thank you very much, Gordana. Um, Vyolta and then Yasmin and then we'll close. Um, actually, I like this question very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would say that crisis overall are of for fertile ground for uh, populist and uh, for different uh, and various ethno ethno, ethno nationalisms. Uh, so and COVID nineteen has proved to to this that uh, yes. Um, the the inabilities of the of the uh, science to I, I guess or the politics to stay away from uh, from science. So I think 
um, you know, what, who is winning in the end, I would like to, to say that it is uh, science that is um, based on humanism, that we bring human, humanism on the, at the center of the, of the research uh, agenda issues, not only related to COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, overall. So in the end, it is this humanist agenda on the science that also uh, is uh, well win. Um, Thank you, Vils. Um, and Yasminka? Um, so, a very interesting question. I also like it very much. Uh, so, uh, the, the good thing of, of this is that science has become the hot topic, you know. So, we have never talked about science so much and, and uh, uh, so that's a good thing. I agree also there's lots of uh, good things, but then also bad things, conspiracies and so forth. But uh, I think there is still a good number of voices that, 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 that uh, fight these conspiracies and, and we should uh, really amplify those voices. So one thing that, that, uh, uh, that makes me happy, you know, is that we have this, this couple from Germany, you know, so the scientists who have uh, participated in this uh, um, creation of this uh, vaccine that that's uh, that, that is showing very promising results, and uh, they are the heroes of today. You know, they, the the scientists made big money, saved the world. So I think uh, we've never talked more about science than in the recent period. As far as the politics, you know, and I mean, this is this is our kind of a standard problem in, in, in this region. But uh, we just have to kind of uh, amplify this, this real scientific voices and give more power to, to science in our societies. Excellent. I love how all three of you uh, highlighted the, the positive aspects um, of the, of course there are challenges, but also the positive aspects of the, of the current moment. Um, there are a few other questions which unfortunately we, we don't have time to get to, uh, and I apologize. I think those of you who have asked questions, all of you, um, and um, thank you very much to the speakers for your invaluable insights, um, for highlighting your experiences um, and the knowledge that you have been exposed to, and that, um, that um, as well as being such bright examples for, for women scientists in the region. Um, I want us to close with another, well, maybe a dose of optimism. So I'm going to ask each of you for about 30 minutes to um, to share what is your one hope for a post-COVID um, world. I will start with um, with Vyolza. Uh, 30 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I will start with um, with uh, um, okay. I um, I'm hoping for a post COVID post COVID world that is uh, fairer, that um, it's where social justice uh, reigns and respect for, for human rights and uh, human dignity and also for uh, gender equality. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, Yasminka? Uh, well, I can I can just second uh, what, what we also just said, but uh, human rights, we know in this region how, how important human right, rights for us all. Uh, diversity, so including everyone in decision make, making and uh, more science. Okay, so that, that, that those are my wishes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Gordana? So I, I hope uh, for uh, society uh, based on the knowledge and sharing. Um, so actually a lot of knowledge is given by, I mean, as kind of gift. But also I, I hope for um, a society where science is for peace and uh, where you have science for peace and towards the society and more human oriented actually to be applied to sort out and solve societal issues. Perfect. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you everyone for joining today's discussion. Um, those with uh, the questions we've asked and those with questions which unfortunately, which, which unfortunately I did not manage to ask today. We will have three more webinars in the coming months, so stay tuned to the British Council um, channels. 
And please virtually join me in thanking um, our three speakers today for being so generous with their insights and their knowledge. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Thank you, Elena, for being a wonderful moderator. <laughs> well. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.